sort of development over the last decade or so, and I do apologise, I will try and stay out of the way as much as possible. Um, <clears throat> this is a photograph from the 2010 season, and uh, I think, as I referenced earlier, the geophysical survey in 2004, if at that point you told anybody in Orkney or any archaeologist that in and amongst all of the, uh, the, the hard Neolithic Orkney and the other um, huge Neolithic monuments and landscape that we've got here, that there would be something of this magnitude and um, something of this importance, I, I really don't think that many people would, would, have, would have believed you. Um, the site has evolved and developed um, in that last decade to, to something that's almost beyond words, to be honest with you. Um, we try and find them every year. I've been coming back since 2010, every season, to excavate just for a short window or whatever I can do. Um, but the last couple of years, I've been fortunate enough to just have the whole eight weeks and, and really absorb all of it, which has been fantastic. So we've got this beginnings um, of the 2010 and my involvement with the site to a very recent drone image from Scott Pike of Willamette University in America. And this is the state of play at the moment. It's not a bad office at all, is it? <laughs> it certainly is. Um, and throughout the course of, um, of the master's degree that I've been doing, it's been building up to a placement module at the end, which relates to either um, work experience or project that you can devise or something you can sort of throw yourself into and um, to gain experience um, and what I decided to do was well I'll tell you <coughs> Nessa Brodka over the last decade as I've said has become so much um, so much more well known and well renowned and, um, and important and these two seminal publications in 2010 and 2014 respectively I believe, and I think everybody would, would agree within the department, really elevated the nest to what it is today. Um, the current archaeology journal in 2010, and um, current archaeology, for those who don't know, is a very uh, well-respected and long-standing um, British archaeological journal, global, in fact, archaeological journal. And uh, in 2014, the National Geographic ran a cover feature on the heart of Neolithic Orkney and the revelations that the nest was throwing up. So that gives you some kind of idea um, and a, a crucial part of my work and my research is audience and is the public and engagement with the archaeology and people's perception of it. And that gives you some kind of idea of the diversity, the spectrum of people that may have an archaeological background and um, that may be coming from a tourist uh, background just visiting the site and visiting Orkney. But in the last few years, I've really noticed when I've been speaking to people that people are visiting Orkney specifically for the archaeology itself and, and often even for the Ness, which is remarkable and, um, and it continues to grow. We continue to be astounded every year by just how many people are coming to Orkney. And all of that has led to, as David alluded to earlier, the BBC's representation, um, Britain's Ancient Capital, which aired this year in January. And um, a lot of us that took part in the excavations last year while the filming was going on, I think it's fair to say, as good as it was for Orkney and as good as it was for the Ness in terms of bringing it into people's consciousness a little bit more, there were certain discrepancies and misrepresentations which led to a conversation with a friend of mine, who I'm glad is here this evening, um, about how it would be lovely to produce something internally that really portrays the beating heart of the site as it is today. And so my project, as I began to devise it, um, what I wanted to do was produce something internally, as I've said. I wanted to gain a skill set, as was the MO of the placement module itself. And I decided to turn to the video, videographic <coughs> approach and to research the impact that that can have on an excavation, on archaeology in general, and the fact that we're having, in this kind of day and age, a growing appetite for archaeology, and there are people that are really sinking their teeth into it, people that perhaps are deciding to study it later on in life, and um, people that are watching, I mean, time to <coughs> isn't really perhaps the, the best references, and not, not quite so televised these days, but certainly things like Digging for Britain really have brought archaeology far more into the public consciousness. And so with that in mind, as I've said, there's the appetite, there's the hunger, there's the market for people to be reached and to, to bring the archaeology and to share it with as many people as possible. And also at the bottom, um, slightly sentimental um, on my part, having, as I say, been, been involved at the site for so long, wanting to do the nest justice. Okay, so the project design, just these bullet points in front of you, roughly outline what it was that I wanted to achieve. I wanted to produce a series of episodic videos from the trenches with a, a kind of digger's perspective. Um, and that term perhaps is a little bit cliched, but I'll go on to the equipment that allowed me to facilitate this a little bit later on. Um, and I wanted to relay all the major finds, discoveries and research of the 2017 season and run that in addition to the Nessa Brodka blog, which already attracts about 100,000 views every season. Um, and of course, it, it grows out width as well. 
further to that, another thing that I wanted to do, and I'm thrilled that there are so many people of you, so many of you here this evening, um, because I really wanted to engage with, with the local archaeological communities, the local people of Orkney, tourists, people that were visiting, to get their perceptions on what the site, what the landscape, what archaeology is. It's an incredibly emotive thing to witness when you hear the sounds of a trowel being scraped across the soil and across a bit of stone and things like that. To actually come and witness excavations, and I think for the nest to be open to the public as it is, is fantastic. And there are so many of you here that I, I know have, have recognised and have even seen coming to the site and visiting over the course of the summer. I also wanted to take that approach with the videos to use social media as a platform to assess the potential that videography has and the place, the growing place that that could have within archaeology, to fulfil that appetite and to fulfil that hunger that's growing, while also enhancing the reputation of the site itself and also the UHI Archaeology Institute, where I've been studying for the last year. Just bear with me while I have a quick sip. So People, Place and Perception, um, the name of the project, derived from the people of the site, the people that built it, the Neolithic people, the people that give it life every eight weeks, um, every year of the excavation season, and the people that come to visit. Similarly with place as well, the nest <coughs> itself, Orkney, the landscape, all of these factors, and perception, which I'll go on to discussing a little bit later on, um, people's thoughts, people's opinions, and, um, and the, the background that people have as to why they're, why they're coming to the site and why they're so interested. Off the back of designing the project and thinking about what I'd like to achieve, um, I'm, this is the bit where I'm just going to stand here and cringe for about a minute because this is a teaser video um, that Sean Page recommended I put together. Sean has been overseeing my project and I'm delighted that he's here as my placement host. Um, throughout the course of the eight-week season, he was getting emails and phone calls and we were probably both stressing each other out, I think it's fair to say. Uh, mountainous workload and things like that. Um, but on Sean's advice, I went down to the site and filmed this brief video that you're going to see in just a moment to really assess the appetite and to assess the market of people um, that I could hopefully reach over the summer. So I'm going to turn away and pretend this isn't happening just for a moment. Okay, so we're here at Vanessa Bodger. We haven't chosen the best day to come down, and um, we've just passed a few small rains at the Salona. Um, but under these tyres here, in the next couple of weeks they're going to be coming off, and the 2017 season is going to be getting underway. I'm Simon Gray, I'm a current master's student at the UHI Archaeology Institute, and over the summer we're going to be filming a series of episodic videos from the site, documenting all the key finds and research, as well as interviewing members of the site team, the public, other associated parties, um, and getting people to kind of perception of what this place is all about and what it means to them. Um, so we're going to take a quick wander up to the Spore Heap now and just have a look at the site from above and I'll tell you a bit more about it then. Spore Heap's a great place it's just to have a quick look over the site from, uh, especially from an area perspective. And you'd be surprised here at the nest, we've got about five or six structures that are being excavated down to the floor level. And um, it doesn't really look like there's a great deal going on down there, but believe me, underneath those tyres, when we get started in a couple of weeks, um, we will be some really interesting results. It can be shared through videos by the Archaeology Institute Facebook page, hopefully through the blog, through Walking Yard. And we'll just keep an eye on it. It's going to be a great time. Okay, I've just about managed to stop myself from going red there as I've watched that, which is, <laughs> wasn't happening this afternoon when I was rehearsing. So, <clears throat> um, But what you've just seen, as I said, is a, is a kind of, was trying to give people an insight as to what they could expect over the summer. Um, <clears throat> and looking back now, I can look back with, with immense pride at the evolution of the skill set that I've learned over the, over the course of the eight weeks at the Nest this year. Um, and I think it's fair to say, I hope I'm right in saying, um, I've got better, slightly. Um, for those of you that may have seen it, hopefully you can back that up. Um, so before I went in, uh, there was a lot of research to do, a lot of um, digging around and, and trying to sort of figure out the best way to go about things. And um, that concerned things like equipment. Um, now I mentioned earlier the, the first person perspective, the digger's perspective that I wanted to, um, to film these videos with. And that led to me researching GoPro cameras, which uh, as maybe you may be aware in the last five or six years especially, they've really elevated um, certain you know sports things like that people taking these cameras these small discrete cameras out and about and, um, and attaching them to various appendages and things like that and it really does especially as, as far as archaeology is concerned it delivers it in such a unique perspective and um, it really i believe makes you feel like you're there without being there and um, which is a kind of fundamental fundamental part of, of what i've been doing so i researched the equipment and um, <coughs> proceeded to uh, decide and debate 
various ways about sourcing equipment. Uh, the camera that's actually filming this talk this evening I used at the site in addition, um, which was donated, or donated but given to me to use by the UHI. And I will talk about the equipment in a little bit more detail a little bit later on. Um, but I researched uses of GoPro within archaeology and um, other excavations around the world that use it. Um, I typed in excavation, uh, GoPro excavation or GoPro excavator into YouTube and all I got was footage of JCBs with GoPros <laughs> attached to them. It wasn't really what I was looking for. Um, but one project in particular that I came across was one in America um, called the Fort St. Joseph Archaeological Project. Um, I had a look at their videos and I found that indeed they did sort of deliver the archaeology in quite a unique way. Um, really giving you the kind of first person access, you can sort of almost reach out and touch things and see people's hands waving around and things like that, which is quite a nice way of looking at it. Um, so that, that kind of helped me, um, but the only downside with that, I didn't find it particularly useful in the sense that it was just drowned by this monstrous soundtrack of, I don't even know, it wasn't jazz, it wasn't anything sort of particularly recognisable, it was just noise, I didn't really enjoy that too much. Um, but the ambience and the sound and the atmosphere of the, an excavation, as I've said before, kind of links into that really emotive nature. Um, the kind of the magic of witnessing archaeology. Further to that, I was fortunate as a master's student to be able to have access to a, a great range of archaeological material concerning the nests, data structure reports that kind of document the, the various seasons and the progression of the excavations and the strategies and things like that, journal articles and other kind of academic papers that have been written about things like the, the pottery, painted stone, decorated stone, all these kind of other things. Further to that, because Video, video diaries, uh, videography was something I had absolutely no experience with whatsoever, so I really had to start from scratch in terms of looking at various tutorials um, and trying to figure out the best way to go about what I was going to be doing. Um, one of which was basically a tutorial into how to use the movie making software that I was using, which was greatly useful because otherwise you wouldn't have these basically. Um, and the other uh, sort of various was uh, the other videos of various kind of. Um, about various techniques of, of videography and um, B-roll, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, and which very simply just refers to small intercepted clips, um, which are either relevant to the footage that you're filming or something completely different, but it just breaks the video up. So if you're talking about one area of the site, you can then move on and interject a little bit of footage to allow people to kind of process what they've just seen. And um, as I say, it can also be relevant, so it can be a continuation of what you've just been discussing. Um, but I've used that quite a few times in the videos as I've been compiling them just to kind of break them up and not make them just a long, monotonous, dull um, kind of explanation of what I'm doing. So a crucial part to videos. I should also say the Digging Deeper guidebook, which was released this year, I wouldn't be doing my job very well if I didn't say that there are a few copies for sale in the back of the room. <laughs> uh, all proceeds will go to the Nessa Book Trust. <coughs> so if you'd like to, um, they're very, very informative. In fact, this was basically my Bible over the course of the summer, um, dating evidence, all the kind of statistical things that I didn't want to get wrong, um, very much a, a fundamental part of the project. So that kind of finishes talking about the preparations. And so equipment, as I've <coughs> talked about, the, um, the camera that is filming this talk was donated from the UHI Archaeology Institute, and it was my intention to use that for the interview purposes, um, talking to people that visited the site and things like that which I have to say took a bit of a back seat really. Um, I'll go on to explain that a little bit later on in a bit more detail, but basically the excavation was just so all-encompassing um, and I had to be so reactive to everything that was going on that a lot of my best laid plans just had to go by the wayside, uh, which was frustrating, but I certainly think that what I did and what I wanted to achieve more than anything um, was bringing the archeology span out there first and foremost, so I was happy to kind of make that adjustment. Um, I just kind of go left to right, so the camera on the left-hand side of the left-hand image. <clears throat> on, the, on the helmet on the desk is a head harness, which was um, used in conjunction with the GoPros, of which I had two. Firstly, um, Scott Timpany, who's in the room, thank, uh, thankfully donated me a GoPro to use for the commencement of the season, until the point at which, and um, again, I'm incredibly grateful for this, uh, um, the Orkney Archaeology Society, purchased and donated the camera to the Nessa Brocker Trust for the use, for the continuation of the project and for use in future years. Um, and as I've said before, they can be attached to various appendages and tripods and things like that, and they're, they're really quite versatile bits of kit, and they have a wide, wide angle kind of lens that they, they use to deliver everything that you're filming. <coughs> I also use my iPhone, which is on the table, and a small little tripod just for sort of additional photographs and things like that. Um, when you rely so heavily on equipment, you're at the mercy of everything being charged, everything working, 
things talking to each other and, and all that kind of stuff. So it was quite good to have as a backup just in case things went wrong. Um, I used my laptop and the iMovie software within the actual compilation of the videos to actually make them. And then the tripod to the right of me as I'm standing um, is, I think that's the first GoPro, I think that's the GoPro 4 that's on that. And then on my person, the chest harness, um, is the other GoPro I was using. But the picture on the right just really kind of shows the context of the context of the camera equipment at the site. And um, part of my plan was to be in the trenches and be in amongst it a little bit and have access, but to try and be the least obtrusive that I can be. Um, and I think a lot of us that were privy to the excavation last year when the BBC were filming, there were elements of, do you mind just kind of moving out of the way for half an hour so we can, oh, can we do that again? You can just pretend that that didn't happen and you lifted it for the first time. So. I really wanted to kind of get into the trenches and deliver everything as it was happening and to, to try and catch those organic moments of discovery and, and the glee that people um, find themselves feeling when, when discoveries are made. <clears throat> so in terms of the day-to-day -day on site, um, I had a very small corner of Lockview, uh, the bungalow on site which was donated to the Trust a few years ago. Um, it was a good little working space. Um, wasn't the, the most spacious, but I made it my own. Um, so I'd, I'd set, my stuff, set my stuff up in the morning, get everything laid out, have a walk around site, gauge what the weather was going to do, and um, to see how that was going to play into my day. If I saw a big rain cloud, it was kind of bright. I've got about half an hour or so to, to get things done before I need to get out of the way. Um, and we're, of course, at the mercy of the weather in Orkney. It can be so inclement at times, um, and especially with the wind, it really can be quite difficult. So um, I'd use that initial walk around the site to kind of gauge the weather, speak to the structure supervisors, ask them about the various projects and various finds that they have going on in their areas, and to gauge some kind of idea of how I could structure my day based upon, I know that they're going to be lifting something in structure five, uh, structure one, structure five, it's not even a structure, um, a little bit later on. Um, and I'd plan my days around these, these kind of events that I knew were, were taking place. Um, I'd plan my videos, and as I said, best laid plans often go awry. I tried to plan everything and um, pre-prepare interviews with people and sort of various aspects of the site that I wanted to film. And I did have to adjust that because I'd set down to do some work and then it would be, oh, Simon, something's just happened in Trench T. I think you're probably going to have to go over and have a look at that because it's, it's pretty cool and shiny. So there was a degree of that. Um, also, while I was walking around the site, I'd be thinking about what I wanted to film, um, the best positions, the best angles, the best cameras often to use as well for that purpose. Um, and as I've mentioned earlier, I think about B-roll as well in terms of, I mean, you'll see in a minute or two, um, it's often footage of Nick's dog, uh, which those of you that have seen the videos um, and kept up to date with the blog will know Bryn is by far the celebrity of the site and more important than anything we do. So, um, <clears throat> In addition to all of this, um, I, as I say, film events um, and decide upon the approach based on whether I, I felt that I wanted to get in there with the GoPro and get something really close up or film from afar and get the, the kind of process of the archaeology rather than kind of seeing it square on and being a little bit in the way which is, as I say, try to avoid as much as possible. Um, I then import the files from the camera, the footage that was shot went onto the computer and then into the iMovie software to then compile the videos and start piecing them together. After that, as I've mentioned before, Sean Page of UHI, um, who was my placement host, I'd compile my videos, run them by Nick first of all, because of course everything has to go past Nick to make sure that it's correct and no misrepresentation is occurring, things like that. Um, and Sean, I would send the files to Sean and he would then add the necessary <coughs> logos and do a final sort of volume adjustment and just make sure that I wasn't talking rubbish the entire time. Um, and his role after that was to share them through the, the, Nessa, um, sorry, the UHI Archaeology Institute's Facebook page. From that point, I would then decide to go home and sometimes shower, um, often, <laughs> often uh, just get round to, to cracking on with the work a little bit before, um, but I'd share them in addition to a few groups on Facebook, um, Orkney Past and Present, which many of you from Orkney, that could, be, well, that could well be where you've seen the videos and things, um, and the Prehistoric Society and Badger, which are both two Facebook groups that are slightly more concerned with archaeology, um, commercial archaeology and the profession itself. So that was how the videos got out there. Uh, it was a lot of work, and one of the big things that I wanted to try and do was establish a house style to make everything that I was doing consistent, recognisable, 
um, to make sure that not only the archaeology itself, um, but also the style and the nature of the videos that I've put together were reasons for them being shared, being liked, being recognised, being watched and things like that. So it was a very important part of what I did, was keeping everything consistent. I think I just about managed it somehow. I'm going to talk to you a little bit now about the actual movie making process. I'll keep it brief because it can be very dull and um, trust me, doing it for eight weeks, it's just, uh, don't want to think about it anymore. Um, <clears throat> But the, the software on the left-hand side, we've got the title caption, um, which relates to an opening sequence, which every video had um, a sort of 10-second intro. I was hoping to keep that in, in keeping with the theme of the video, um, making sure that everything was relevant. Um, for instance, this is the very first video that I did, and you can see the footage of people shifting tires and things like that, which is a big part of un un unfilling the site and getting everything unpacked and things. It's just a process that a lot of people don't get to see. Um, people will drive past the site at the start of the season before we've really got started and they think, what is this field? What's, what's all that kind of <coughs> modern art installation? It just doesn't look quite the same as, as when we get them off. So that was quite a nice way I felt of, of bringing that um, to the public, to, uh, to the videos in that respect. Um, the left hand side on the bottom, it's just a quick print screen of, of iMovie in terms of selecting the, the relevant um, captions and things, and as I say, establishing that style that was going to be consistent throughout the whole project. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I've made a very short video, which I'll show you in just a moment, um, but I'm going to step round to the other side and just talk you through what you see in front of you, which was the screen that was making my head hurt for eight weeks, to be quite frank. Um, as I said, the camera Cameras, various cameras would be connected to the computer, I could sort of import all the footage and then drag them into this section here, from where I could then drag them down onto the, the bar at the bottom, which is where the video is compiled, and, and snip them and edit them and trim them. And these small little, um, little boxes in between the clips are what we call transitions, and they just allow, rather than the very harsh, crisp cutting between the clips that we saw in the first video, something I, I refined throughout the process, it just allows them to merge and to blend um, in a natural way to make them seem slightly less harsh on the eye. Um, so I'll just quickly talk about the content of the video first before I show it to you. Um, the opening sequence is the, one of the drone, uh, drone images from Scott <coughs> Park, um, showing the site um, from the air. Um, there's footage of Structure 1, and in Structure 1 this year they were dismantling a wall um, to revert the original shape of the structure back to its original blueprint. Um, this wall was a late tradition that was put in to kind of cut the the internal space in half. Um, so it's quite a, a big job really, um, and that's one of the projects I kept returning to throughout the course of the videos to make sure that I was keeping up to date with their progress. Um, and I wanted to provide people with something that they could raise questions about, you know, how they get one with the wall, things like that. <coughs> um, so there's a before and after shot of that, courtesy uh, statutory rather footage of Bryn, the dog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that just needs to get in there, just has to. Um, and what I've, what I've done with the B-roll of Bryn on this occasion is, as I've said, split it up between two separate events. And on the other side, um, there's some footage from one of the other, site, uh, other areas of the, of the main site, a uh, substantial bone deposit, which is, um, has been 3D imaged, 3D mapped. I still don't really know what they do with the cameras and all that kind of thing. Um, and some more drone shots to kind of pan out from that area to give a, a bit of context to that location within the site and provide a little bit. And the final clip, which finishes, um, it's got an image of this arrowhead, which is a, an early Bronze Age arrowhead, late Neolithic early Bronze Age arrowhead, which we found. And, and that really filled in a lot of blanks for us because we have Iron Age interaction with the nests in the other field over in Trench T. But the Bronze Age interaction and that kind of overlap between the end of the Neolithic and the start of the Bronze Age is something we didn't have necessarily and this really provided provided us with that glimpse which was fantastic but this particular bit of footage is something that I just didn't get around to using I think for whatever reason uh, it might have been that somebody was asking me to do something else or um, my plan changed anyhow of course it wouldn't be a learning process without having a great deal of problems um, and hopefully balancing them with some successes which I think I, I managed in, in fair, uh, fair medium so of course, as I've mentioned before, you're massively reliant on technology and um, sometimes they, they just don't want to play ball and it really can mess up your day and um, the three or four of you that were the, here that were at the nest over the summer can probably remember that, that day, the meltdown, um, <clears throat> where I rather embarrassingly had to go to everybody on tea break and say, I know I've been making videos for the last two or three weeks but 
does anyone know how to do it? <laughs> uh, just a, a really, really awful day. Um, but despite the amount of time that I lost, <coughs> it was only a, a problem that I didn't have again. I learned how to fix it, I learned what was leading to it, and, um, and moved on. Um, briefly, I've mentioned the weather, and you've, you've heard in that video there just the, the part that the wind can play and how, how obtrusive and, um, and difficult to deal with that can be sometimes. And I've also alluded to the difficulties that I had keeping up with everything that was going on. Um, starting something, not quite finishing it, having to abandon something. Um, the plans for each video just had to change sometimes. Could have really done with an extra pair of hands, which I might maybe advocate for, perhaps if I was to come back and do this in the future. Um, the lengthy editing process, um, what you didn't see with the, the videos and, and the kind of compilation of the videos, was me sat around the table at about 25 to 12 every night thinking, oh crikey, I've got to be up in seven and a half hours, this isn't great, is it? Pass the scotch. Uh, no, I was professional at all times. Um, <clears throat> but I really did have a great deal of successes with the project as well. Um, the figures that I'm about to show you in just a moment really speak for themselves. Um, in addition to the figures, uh, I've just focused on Facebook. Um, and there's also Twitter and YouTube statistics. I'm going to draw on in my work but not focus on too heavily because it's just Aladdin's den, everything's going on all at once and there are too many things to really sort of talk about and, and refine. So um, I do believe that I successfully promoted the NES and the UHI Archaeology Institute. Um, with regards to the latter, there was a lady that commented on one of my videos about two or three weeks in um, who then came to see me on site and said that the videos had played a substantial role in her considering coming to Orkney, coming to the UHI because she wanted to be able to dig at the NES. Um, and the, the, the placement element of the, of the masters is something that I'm very fortunate to have been able to dig at the site that I love so dearly um, and take part for the whole eight weeks while also doing a bit of work at the same time. Um, I've been contacted by a few teachers that have used these as kind of teaching resources, which I think is fantastic. Um, I'm not sure, I, I think it may even have been at university level, just as perhaps a kind of refresher of what's going on at Vanessa Brodka. Um, but certainly since the national curriculum changed a few years ago to include prehistory, um, things like this, you know, they, they could definitely be, be sort of applicable to, to primary education as well. There's been press and media engagement. Um, the Orcadian um, Current Archaeology and History Scotland, respectively, to varying degrees, um, have made approaches to the UHI. Um, to draw on the work that I've done to a small extent. The majority of it is that they're wanting to do a big piece on the site, but also kind of factor in my work a little bit, which is fantastic. Um, what I wanted to do more than anything was establish a framework to see if something like this was viable, was going to be popular. Um, and I really think that considering the problems and the successes that I've had, I've learned a lot. And I think if I was to go back and do it all over again, I'd be more refined and more driven, more focused. Um, and I'd know how to get around computer meltdowns and I wouldn't turn to school. Uh, engagement with the local community, this is something I alluded to earlier that I had to, I had to put that on the back burner a little bit because, as I said, everything was going on and it was so reactive and I needed to kind of get around and, and film as much as possible. But I tried as much as possible to engage with people that were commenting on the videos and people that were approaching me and saying, oh, you're the guy from the NES, aren't you? Um, and it was lovely, actually, that that, that, that was happening because it, it meant that people were actually watching them. Um, but more so, they were approaching me with questions and they wanted to find out more, they wanted to know what the next video was going to be about and all that kind of stuff as well. So, a real balance um, of hot and cold, definitely, but certainly things that I've learned from in the process. And this is just a screenshot <coughs> of one of the videos. And um, Those of you that are familiar with Facebook, I'm sure you'll recognise this kind of format here. <coughs> so, we've got the uh, opening sequence um, Sean's description that he would add to the upload and um, just to kind of bring to people's attention what the video is going to be about, a link to the Nessa Broca website as well. Um, I'm fairly disappointed actually with that, that viewing figure, 6,634. That was kind of, to be honest actually, that was roughly average. Um, as I'll show you in just a second, there were some that really skyrocketed, others that perhaps weren't viewed as many times but were certainly shared for various purposes and things like that. But it really helped me assess um, the hunger and the appetite for various stories and various aspects of an archaeological excavation that people are most interested in. And that certainly helped as I went along. <coughs> so, a bit of number crunching, I'll keep this very brief. Um, over the course I collected about 100 hours of raw footage, which as you can probably imagine played into the editing up until sort of midnight on occasions and things like that. 
um, <clears throat> roughly an hour and 20 minutes worth of videos, um, over the 19 videos overall. Awful lot of data. Um, but the Facebook reach of over 370, of almost 370,000 gives you a real idea of, of the kind of power that social media has with regards to delivering content, especially archaeology, out to the wider public. Um, and the reach basically just refers to the amount of people that have seen the video on their Facebook when they've logged in at some point. Um, of course, from that point, it's only a select few that may go on to view them. Um, and accumulatively, that was over 124,000 views across Facebook alone. I say across Facebook alone because on the Nestle Pocket website, there's a separate view count. Unfortunately, the data from that isn't quantifiable. So that's something that I've not been able to, um, to ascertain. But certainly, as I've said before, focusing on Facebook is the main kind of driving, um, driving force of the research. I think I've really managed to get some decent figures um, to interpret and things like that. In terms of the Facebook shares, that was just under 1,000. Um, and as you can see, some of the high numbers on here. Uh, the first part of a two-part interview that I did with Nick Card reached 100, it was 120 shares that that received. And I think that was in part due to the time of day that it was uploaded. And I think that really caught the American market. And people that may have been to Nick Card lecture tours in America and things like that, getting up and having their <coughs> Weetos or I can't think of any American cereals at the moment, but I think that really kind of captured that bar, that market at the right time. And so going forward, that would be another strategy that I would perhaps employ <coughs> is thinking about the time of day the videos are uploaded, the surface to the potential reach. I promise I'm getting towards the end. I really am. So this uh, graph here just shows the kind of various spikes. Um, <clears throat> the yellow um, yellow bar is the reach, and blue is the viewing statistics. So as you can see, that video that I just talked about with Nick, the one on the right-hand side of the image here, that's a, a reach of over 42,000 and over, just over, well, over 14,300 views. So that kind of gives you a, an idea of the, the potential, you know, the way that some videos and some stories can just balloon. Um, another popular one was the decorated stone, the butterfly motif. I'm not sure if any of you have even seen the videos, to be, <laughs> to be fair. Perhaps that's something I should ask at some point. Um, but that was a really emotive story. In fact, Sean got in touch with me um, from college to say, look, it's probably worth doing something on this because I've been approached by media outlets and things and there's a real hunger for this story. So I think you'd be doing well to, to report it and to, to kind of bring it to people, which I did. Um, just the only final other thing that I'll talk about in this little graph here is the teaser video, which is the very first one. Um, the viewing statistics for that currently sit at 10,810. Um, I think, Sean, I think I'm right in saying that 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 got about 8,000 or so between its release and the start of the season. Um, and that really kind of gave me an idea of the market, as I, as I said earlier, trying to establish how many people I could potentially be speaking to. Um, so that is basically all the number crunching that I'm going to bore you with at the moment. However, there is another graph, I do apologise. Um, I've already talked about this, this is the sharing statistics, so 120 shares for Nick Card, first part interview. It's a shame to see that the second part kind of tailed off, but it's just one of those things. Um, perhaps it may be that it was shared so that people kept an eye out for the second part. That's what I'm telling myself anyway. Um, yeah, the first one, I think in, in advance, the teaser video, that, that was shared 94 times. And I think that was another way of people kind of being interested um, in the prospect of the project and, and trying to make people aware of, of what was going on. Sorry, I'm anyway, um, <coughs> Yeah, but you know, I, I've learned from this process that Facebook, especially, um, but social media as a whole is just such a big vehicle, it's such a driving force um, for any kind of content that you like to convey. If you know your market, if you know the followership that you can potentially achieve, then the sky's the limit, really. Um, so just to conclude, um, I'd hope that I'd be right in saying that I've, I've kind of cemented and um, added to the argument that there is a place for videography within archaeology. And in fact, as technology and, and camera equipment becomes more discreet, more powerful, as social media becomes more of a, a, a kind of big factor in people's lives, it's a really good way of bringing the archaeology out to people um, and allowing, allowing us to share what we're doing with you. Um, I also found that being embedded within the team and a familiarity um, with the site and with the people at the site, as opposed to being somebody that was just dropped in from a, a production company, was a great benefit. Knowing the people and being able to say, you know, just quickly tell me frankly what's going on. Is it worth filming? No. Is it worth filming? Yes. Come back. It's amazing. Right. Okay. And um, really helped because, you know, especially with the BBC documentary that, that took place, the gentleman that was doing the filming, a cameraman called Ed, and he was a lovely chap, 
Um, and I was talking to him about some of his previous work, and he'd been to Antarctica, he'd done stuff for, he'd worked with David Attenborough, which I was blown away by. Um, and here he was at our humble little site in, in the heart of Neolithic Orkney. Um, but as I say, that familiarity really is important, I think. And it allows you to kind of talk about things in an authoritative way, but also, I think it also allows you to kind of not dumb things down, but certainly present things in a, in a mutually accessible way for a various eclectic audience, people that aren't interested in archaeology, people that have got a real great background in it, things like that. The equipment, as much as I can say that I've had a lot of problems with it and it posed, posed issues at certain points, um, the GoPros were fantastic. And once again, I'd like to thank OES for their donation of the, <coughs> the Hero 5 through, um, through the, donation, uh, the continuation of the project. Um, I think I learned the strategies in terms of bringing the equipment into the trenches, when it's best to use a small discrete camera, when it's best to set the tripod up. All these, all these things are very, very small little, little learning curves, but they're very important in terms of the, the final execution. And as I've touched on already, the social media aspect being a really powerful tool for marketing and promotion. And the, the successes and failures overall, I really think, have, have devised a format um, to allow me to possibly continue this into the future, or we'll certainly pass it on um, as a body of work for somebody that may take up the mantle in future years. And so, I will finish by thanking you all for your time. By being here tonight, you've, you've actually become part of the research. Um, the crowd that are actually here tonight, I have no idea it would be so substantial. Um, I hope that if any of you have seen the videos that you enjoyed them. Um, we'll take some questions in just a moment and I'd like to welcome people to, to continue to give feedback and, and provide any kind of additional uh, criticisms or, or sort of positive feedback. I really would welcome it all because it will help me as I write the project up. So thank you very much again.